Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Karen Bell, and I'm an Associate Director of Partners for Advancing Health Equity, a national learning collaborative funded by a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and based at the Tulane University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, and it's titled Next Steps in Addressing Pregnancy-Related Mortality. Here in New Orleans, we stand on land known as Balbancha, a Choctaw word meaning a place of other languages. We honor generations past and present of the several tribes who live in this area. At Partners for Advancing Health Equity, or P4HE for short, we aim to bring together people and organizations across multiple sectors to understand and collaboratively work on critical issues related to attaining health equity. This includes scholars, funders, community organizations, representatives from the private sector, or basically anyone who is committed to advancing toward the goals of health equity. At P4IG, we want to go beyond simply documenting health inequities to identifying the actions required to actually achieve equity. We do this in part by providing spaces for insightful conversations on important topics like this semi-monthly webinar series with the aim of promoting actionable solutions. In these webinars, we will bring together thought leaders to discuss their work and the next steps toward health equity. We began this series by discussing the next steps in the field of health equity broadly. Today, we will focus on a specific but very important issue, pregnancy-related mortality. This topic has always been a major concern for maternal health and reproductive justice advocates, but the loss of the right to abortion with the probable overturning of the Roe v. Wade Supreme Court decision has thrust reproductive rights to the top of our current national conversation. In today's webinar, we'll engage in a conversation with experts in research on racism, as well as research on policy that impacts pregnancy-related mortality like abortion access and Medicaid expansion. We also have leaders in the field of community and culturally centered care for women and birthing people. You'll be able to join us in this conversation through the chat by asking questions of our panelists that will be answered during the Q&A portion of this session or by using the hashtag partners, the number four HE on social media. And you can do that both during and after the webinar. Okay, so let's get to the topic at hand. Pregnancy, birthing, and parenthood can be joyous and beautiful experiences. However, the death of a pregnant person spreads grief throughout families and communities. Most deaths during pregnancy are preventable, but every year about 700 women and birthing people die during pregnancy or shortly thereafter. From 2007 to 2016, the mortality rate ranged anywhere from 35 to 45 deaths per 100,000 live births for Black pregnant people. And in this same time period, the mortality rate was between 25 and 35 deaths per 100,000 live births for Native American pregnant people. We know that racism is the root cause of health inequities across racial and ethnic lines, and the cause of these preventable deaths is the racism that Black and Native American women and birthing people endure both before and during pregnancy and inside and outside of the healthcare system. The mortality rate sadly increased in Black and Hispanic or Latinx pregnant people during the COVID-19 pandemic, demonstrating that the effects of the pandemic are so pervasive that they exacerbate racial and ethnic inequities in pregnancy-related mortality. A good deal of research and advocacy efforts to help address pregnancy-related mortality have been implemented, such as the CDC's Hear Her Educational Program, which teaches pregnant people and their families what the signs of an adverse event are for pregnant people, urging them to go to their healthcare provider with their concerns. Most states have a maternal mortality review committee, the Momnibus Act from the Black Maternal Health Caucus in the U.S. Congress has been proposed, and in mid-April, we had Black Maternal Health Week. However, we should look to the reproductive justice framework, as well as advocates and organizations that have been doing ongoing 
reproductive justice work. Though this work is gaining more visibility in the media, it is clear that we cannot assume that rights won't be taken. The right to abortion will likely be rescinded, and this will swiftly result in old truer laws being enacted and new, even more restrictive laws that will create inequity in access to abortion care, depending on where you live and how much money you have. This will also lead to increases in pregnancy-related mortality and exacerbate inequities by race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. Though some often blame the mother's behaviors for these tragic deaths or focus on individual level interventions, it is clear that institutional, structural, and policy level factors impact pregnancy-related mortality. Research from two of our panelists has found that states with reduced access to abortion and Medicaid have higher rates of pregnancy-related mortality. A flurry of recent protests and activism for abortion rights across the U.S. after the leaked draft opinion from the Supreme Court should be considered along with reproductive justice organizations that long sounded the alarm about the tenuous right to bodily autonomy for pregnant people, including further political efforts to control the bodies, choices, and opportunities of women and birthing people, including restriction of abortion pills, telemedicine that prescribes abortion pills, and even limiting contraception. In Louisiana, recently a state senator proposed a bill that would allow murder charges for doctors who perform abortions and the pregnant people who would have an abortion. There have already been several instances of people being charged who have had a stillbirth or a miscarriage. These efforts are about restricting the rights of women and birthing people. One of the main tenets of health equity is the right to health care and the opportunity for everyone to live the healthiest life possible. Access to abortion care and pregnancy-related mortality is a prime example of a critical health equity issue in need of major collaborative effort across multiple sectors. We must support all types of efforts that reduce pregnancy-related mortality and provide care, ensure rights, and pursue justice for all women and birthing people. Our collaborative is committed to bringing together people and organizations across sectors to work toward our shared goals of health equity. It is clear that we have to take the next steps toward health equity for pregnancy and people and birthing, um, excuse me, women and birthing people to save lives because it is not guaranteed that the right to health and well-being will be respected. So we've invited four panelists across multiple sectors who are doing that work to give their perspectives on the next steps toward equity for birth pregnancy-related mortality. All right, so first we have Marian Jarlitsky. Dr. Jarlitsky is an associate professor in the School of Public Health at the University of Pittsburgh. Her research examines the impact of Medicaid policy on maternal mortality and morbidity, as well as opioid treatment during pregnancy. We also have Shaye Lucero, who is the board president for the Changing Women Initiative. The Changing Women Initiative is a nonprofit organization that provides culturally integrated health care for the Native American and Indigenous women and families that they serve, including home birth services and a women's wellness clinic. Ms. Lucero is a student and practitioner of Pueblo Healing Traditions, a resident of the Pueblo Laguna, and graduate of the University of New Mexico. Next, we have Mishan Sadiq, who is the Senior Program Manager for Maternal Health and Child Health at the Institute of Women and Ethnic Studies. The Institute of Women and Ethnic Studies is a nonprofit organization that works with communities, schools, individuals, and organizations to provide tailored health and wellness services that address this lack of health options and access here in New Orleans. Ms. Sadiq's work centers on birthing and breastfeeding, including providing support as a doula and maternal health programs. Lastly, we have Maeve Wallace. She is an assistant professor here at the Tulane University School of Public Health. She's a reproductive and perinatal epidemiologist, and her research focuses on the social, structural, and policy determinants of maternal and child health, as well as racial and ethnic health inequities. Welcome, and thank you all for joining us. Great. Okay, I'm very excited. I'm ready to just go ahead and get started. And I'm going to start with you, Mae. 
I really want to ask you about your work on the impact of abortion access on pregnancy-related mortality. Tell us what you found in your research and what you view as the next steps for health equity in this area. Hi, Karen. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here and for that wonderful introduction, which I think really set up uh, a lot of the work that that we've done and that we've been trying to show empirically. So, um, me and my team and I have been studying the impact of state abortion restriction policies on maternal and child health outcomes for some time now. Um, and just to summarize, in short, we find that rates of maternal mortality are higher in states with more restrictive abortion climates. And that's true for infant mortality as well. And so we're looking at all manner of um, restrictions related to who and when and how persons within the state can obtain a, a wanted abortion. Um, and some of the reasons that I think it's important to know why we might be seeing these associations. Well, for one, we know that pregnancy and childbirth can be more dangerous than receiving an abortion in terms of risk of morbidity and mortality. And so this is especially true for women, for example, who might be experiencing ill health or chronic conditions before pregnancy and for whom pregnancy and childbirth could then <clears throat> potentially exacerbate these conditions, make them more likely to experience a severe morbidity or mortality during pregnancy and childbirth. <clears throat> Excuse me. So forcing, you know, these kinds of women to, to continue to carry an unwanted pregnancy to term really forces them to endanger their own lives by carrying and delivering uh, the pregnancy. And um, from a reproductive justice framework, and thank you for um, framing this whole panel around that framework, um, we know that people with the least institutional power and limited access to resources are going to be both less able to obtain an abortion in a restrictive climate and more likely to suffer health consequences during pregnancy and that arise from uh, the same sort of sources of oppression. So I'm talking about things like structural racism, gendered racism, economic oppression, the intersection of all of these things, and then the impact that they have on, on what we would say in public health are more downstream, sort of the social determinants of health that we know are related to risk of death during pregnancy and postpartum. Um, and so these are the kinds of reasons uh, that I, I, I might add, if there's any Louisiana senators in the audience, these are the kinds of reasons why places like Louisiana have such high maternal mortality rates. Um, and, one, and one last really salient finding I wanted to share um, with regard to our work on abortion restrictions and maternal death is its relation to maternal homicide. Um, so our, our work and others have really consistently shown over decades at this point that homicide is a leading cause of death among pregnant and postpartum women, and that women who are pregnant or have recently given birth are more likely to be killed than women who are not pregnant or postpartum and are of reproductive age. And so, you know, most of these cases are involving intimate partner violence, and we know that pregnancy can add stress in a relationship that might already be vulnerable to violence. It can increase the severity of violence inflicted by an intimate partner. And, and you know, really rich qualitative uh, research on reasons why women seek abortion often include um, ending an abusive relationship as a common reason. And so again, abortion restriction policies, policies that limit bodily autonomy, um, those that restrict or outright ban abortion care, which is um, sort of the, the post-Roe future we're looking at in a number of states with trigger laws, um, will be forcing women to continue to carry unwanted pregnancies into situations that is dangerous for themselves or their current or future children, um, both in terms of obstetric morbidity and mortality and violent death. Um, so to me, this is all a failure to trust women, to listen to women. Um, and I want to say explicitly black women and other women of color um, who, you know, as you detailed uh, in the introduction, really overwhelmingly bear the burden of both maternal mortality and maternal homicide in this country. So uh, allowing women or pregnant people to make decisions for themselves for whatever reason they have to make that decision, um, can we're seeing can have really real and life or death consequences. And so um, I'll stop there. No, um, you, you said a lot in, in that um, description of your research. And I want to um, point out that we are paying attention to the chat as well as you can um, submit questions that you want for the q and I saw somebody just mentioned um, the comments from our Senator here in Louisiana, Bill Cassie. We're definitely gonna talk about that, but um, your research uh, 
as well as the research of others contextualizes the actual experiences of women and birthing people in relation to deciding whether or not to have an abortion, all of the actual lived experiences that um, go before that decision can come as a result of not being able to make that decision, which is what's being restricted um, through these um, bills and policies. So thank you for sharing that. I want to pivot to Ms. Lucero. Um, can you tell us about your work? Um, we invited you obviously because of the work of the Changing uh, Women Initiative, but can you just tell us about your work in this area of reproductive justice and what's going on in your community? Good afternoon, good morning, um, wherever you are in the country. Um, my name is Shae Lucero. I am from the Pueblos of Acoma and Laguna. I am of the Roadrunner clan for my um, mother and a turkey child for my late father. This is how we introduce ourselves um, as a native Pueblo woman. Um, abortion can be a taboo subject in parts of Indian country. However, our traditional medicine people knew of the t techniques in the abortive plant required to perform one. And throughout our tribes, we each have a varied view on death. Some tribes like mine, the Pueblos, will care for the body and bring it into a person's home before for a wake before returning to the earth. Some tribes like the Dene, the, the Navajo people, um, view death as a taboo and will utilize the services of a mortuary. But the one thing we do have in common, our commonality is ceremony. And because there are different views of um, on providing abortion care throughout Indian country, abortion, miscarriage, stillbirth, it does require counseling, long discussions and guidance from the healer, as well as you know the ceremony to provide and restore and correct that balance following, um, following um, this medical or an abortion or miscarriage or stillbirth. Our founder and Navajo midwife, Nicole Gonzalez, is licensed to perform medical induced abortions up to 12 weeks. However, as a healer, she too will require ceremony for the protection of prayer surrounding the CWI organization and to restore her own balance. And the balance in any country isn't always black and white. Uh, Native American healers, including those at CWI, undergo a spectrum of decisions when it comes to the care of our people. And ceremony always, always plays a large part in those decisions. At CWI, if, if an abortion is referred, it's referred to another medical group, uh, most often Planned Parenthood. But CWI will work to provide post-abortion care, including counseling, contraception, and ceremony. And despite New Mexico being a state where abortion care is supported, those who live outside of Albuquerque still have to drive into the city for abortion services. In these situations, family will have to plan accordingly um, because New Mexico is a vast area. So geography plays a lot into it, which requires gas, time off of work, and often emotional support. And because abortion is a taboo subject, they, they don't get that very often within their own communities. Many Native Americans live within the, or live below the poverty line and do not live within close proximity to Albuquerque, where a lot of the abortion care is provided. So they struggle with transportation to access those abortion services and pay, also paying for the services itself. And it's important to understand that the complexity of access to abortion services that Native Americans face in Indian country because the majority of our healthcare is tied to government funding. And under the Hyde Amendment, abortion care funding is restricted to only being used within Indian health services for one, to save a mother's life, or two, when the pregnancy is a an, result as an act of rape, or when three, the pregnancy is a result of incest. However, the Hyde Amendment restricts a woman's productive rights and it prevents many, many low-income women, especially Native American women, from accessing safe, legal um, abortion services. And traditionally in Native American communities, reproductive health decisions weren't, were a woman's business and left to the individual woman to decide for herself. So right now, uh, Change of Women Initiative is beginning to work alongside organizations like um, Indigenous Women Risen, who are currently working to provide equity in access to healthcare, particularly abortions. 
They currently have an abortion fund that is open to all indigenous people in the United States and Canada. And there is currently no other indigenous centered abortion fund in the United States. And, indig and indigenous women rising is working to serve the indigenous community as a trusted resource for sexual and reproductive health. And basically through these community partnerships, we're, we're working hard to help Native American be able to empower themselves to once again, make well-informed decisions for themselves. You also said a lot <laughs> and I was taking notes. <laughs> um, one of the things, well, you, you mentioned the geographic issue, right? And sort of in the introduction, I tried to allude to geography and talking about a map of inequity, but simply the fact that you women have to go into Albuquerque um, to receive these services. Um, and I imagine other services as well and how that in itself leads to inequity as well as you mentioned the Hyde Amendment um, being linked to um, federally funded healthcare and how that also inherently is a driver of inequities. I think that um, these issues are quite complex and that the full story needs to be told. And so that's what I'm hearing from both what you said and what Maeve said as well, that it's not just these simple um, black and white sort of things. Do you have abortion access or not? Like it's a whole life that women and birthing people um, live and is affected by the decisions of people outside of themselves. So yeah, thank you for that um, and explaining and contextualizing um, those experiences. Um, I want to move on to uh, actually uh, the senator, <laughs> senator's comments, um, which technically uh, were not related to abortion access, but kind of are, but I want to pivot a little bit and talk about racism. So um, one of our senators, if you uh, click on the link in the chat, um, there has been an interview by uh, Bill Cassidy, one of our senators here in Louisiana. Um, he was recently quoted in an interview um, in Politico, but the sort of, uh, it's become, gotten a lot of attention through a Vanity Fair um, article um, over, kind of over the weekend has gotten a lot of attention on social media. And he was talking or commenting about the extremely high maternal mortality rate here in Louisiana um, and seeming to blame the high rate on Black women and dismissively um, said, and I quote, for whatever reason, people of color have a higher incidence of maternal mortality. Um, in the, the uh, interviewer sort of followed up with him and he said, oh, because of access to care and um, I think he did use the term implicit bias, but it was still sort of a dismissive way of thinking about the um, racial inequities that are experienced by um, Black Native American women as well. And like I said um, earlier, the Hispanic or Latinx pregnancy related mortality rate has increased um, or increased during the pandemic. Uh, we know that it's racism that causes these higher rates of pregnancy-related mortality and morbidity in um, Black women and um, Native American women and um, recently um, Hispanic or Latino women and birthing people. But this question is for you, um, Mishan. Um, how do you deal with or think about sort of this dehumanizing ideology um, from people in power that tends to blame Black people when your work is about sort of empowering and doing community-based work that is empowering for um, Black people and Black women and birthing people. <clears throat> Thank you again for having um, us here today. And yes, that is, a, a, I'm taken aback a, a little bit about the question I've been on the phone this morning with some of my colleagues about this very question and not wanting to be reactionary, but also thinking that this is not surprising. Uh, this is what we've been dealing with, where I love uh, having Dr. Wallace present because the research, it, the research shows it, that it is uh, impl implicit bias, it is racism, it's the reason why Black women are dying. And just to hear uh, a comment um, that devalues a life 
It doesn't matter the race of the individual, just we don't care. But the data shows that Black women and Black birthing people are dying because of systemic racism. And that's the reason why we're doing this work together. And when I say you, we, I'm talking about the researchers um, that are doing a great job of making sure that we understand the numbers, but also organizations like uh, where I am, the Institute of Women and Ethnic Studies, who has been around for almost 30 years doing community-based research and uh, utilizing a human-centered design. And using that, we make sure that we're uh, utilizing the voices of our community members when we're planning a program, when we're implementing a program, and when we're evaluating a program, because it's, <clears throat> it goes beyond the numbers and understanding why individuals are dying or why they're receiving subpar care when you listen to what they actually went through. So in 2020 and 2021, we conducted a series of in-depth interviews and focus groups with Black women and white women who um, experienced severe maternal morbidities here in Louisiana, who had babies in the NICU, who uh, were breastfeeding. And then during the COVID pandemic, we also interviewed individuals who chose to have a home birth because of uh, the COVID experience, um, the changes in hospital policies. And from that, we heard that women really understand that they are dying and that it's, um, very disheartening to know that when women, Black women go into the hospital to have a baby, they are concerned that they might not come out alive. And they understand that going into the doors. And so how, what do we do? So what came out of those focus groups, some things that I thought was very um, important that we need to take to senators like Bill Cassidy so that he can sit. And I would love for him to sit with myself and some of my colleagues so that we can really work together on it because just sending out a press release or tweeting about uh, the comment is not enough. We need to head face racism right in, in this face. And so sitting down together and saying what it looks like and talking about what can we do because we have the tools necessary in our state to make the changes. And so if we can sit at that table uh, we can talk about what they, uh, the individuals talked about in our focus group, that communication is important, that providers need to sit down and communicate effectively what issues are going on with that individual and build a trusting relationship. It is not that women do not want to be or compliant to what their doctor's orders are, but if they can't trust you, then they don't understand or don't value what's coming across the table because they think that they might die based on the, the instructions that may be given. So trust is important that we need to do. And also care coordination. In Louisiana, and Dr. May can share her data, but we've learned that women are dying for overdose. Like what are we doing as a state to make sure that women are screened properly, what are we making sure that they uh, can collaborate, uh, a provider can collaborate with a mental health provider to make sure that they get the support? And are we utilizing policies that are more punitive in our state? So if we hear the voices of the individuals that um, have these concerns, if we listen to those voices and create programs, create policies that address those issues, then we can have a healthier state. I'll, I'll stop there. I, I can go. go. I, this time. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted you to keep going, but I appreciate um, what you were saying, how you were how you were describing the work. Um, not just saying these are the things that we do, but really the beliefs of um, of of your programs and how it's about listening to the voices, um, human centered work. I think that that is highlighted in what um, the previous panelists talked about and is clearly what is necessary to do this type of work. So thank you for describing it in that way. You also mentioned something that links your work to um, Marion's work about overdose and uh, coordinating care. So um, Dr. Jarlinski, your work, um, you, you you do a lot of research, <laughs> but one of the things that uh, we noticed was that your work um, looks at pregnancy experiences of people who use 
opioids, cannabis, and other substances. How do you see the concept of equity in that research? Yeah, well, I'd like to uh, start by uh, tying this back to the reproductive justice framework. So reproductive justice is not only the ability to be pregnant or not be pregnant, but also to um, parent in a way that is supported. And so this means that uh, people who have stigmatizing conditions, like people who use illicit substances in pregnancy, um, also uh, need to be able to um, have their pregnancy and be able to parent in a supportive way. And it's, it, it's a tough um, chronic condition to have. It's quite stigmatized. Um, we've seen um, a lot of focus uh, from the public and policymakers on infants who have withdrawal symptoms, um, almost to the ex exclusion of thinking about uh, the consequences for uh, pregnant people themselves. Um, I think we can definitely learn some lessons from the epidemic of crack babies that wasn't in the 1980s. So some of you may recall, um, or you may have read about the, the situation with crack babies. And it turns out um, it took 20 years, but finally there was a, a, some research that could not uh, delineate effects of in utero cocaine exposure from effects of poverty. Mm -hmm. So we have to, again, think about the underlying uh, uh, causes in communities. And we have to think about um, supporting the family and um, treating the family. Um, and, you know, part of that is the pregnancy, but but part of it is also what happens before uh, pregnancy and after pregnancy. There are a lot of equity components um, with substance use disorder, just like any other chronic condition. Uh, so we recently uh, published some research demonstrating that uh, black people were less likely to receive medication treatment for opioid use disorder than white people because they, their opioid use disorder was identified at a later date in pregnancy. The most common question that we got when we were presenting this paper is, oh, well, don't black people just have later prenatal care initiation than similar white people? No, we had to go back and we showed that regardless of having the same average number of healthcare visits, healthcare providers had a delayed diagnosis of opioid use disorder in, in black patients, which delayed their treatment, their medication treatment. Um, another example is the... Um, the mandatory reporting to the child welfare services. Now we can have a whole conversation about what kind of interventions we would like to implement in child welfare, equity, equity focused interventions, and that, that would be great. But, but what I'd like to focus on is that patients do perceive the child welfare reporting as a, as a punitive, um, whether or not it's intended to be. Um, so we have forthcoming research that shows that uh, that black people, being black is a major predictor of um, being uh, tested for substance use at labor and delivery. But in fact, black people are less likely to have a positive um, toxicology screen for substance use relative to white people at labor mm -hmm. and delivery. And so there's a lot of inequities um, in the, the healthcare system unfortunately. And, and I think my research and also others on the panelists, um, that's, that's part of what we're struggling with is how do we develop healthcare system interventions? And then how, how, if it's possible, can we integrate with caregivers who are outside of the formal healthcare system, doulas and other caregivers? They may not want to be part of the healthcare system, but, but can, we, um, can we address those tensions? And I, I think... Um, well, I could say more. I mean, I think this, this, the title of this is the next steps um, in reducing um, pregnancy-related mortality. And certainly we know that the overdose is one of the leading causes of uh, mortality in the first year after delivery. But um, I think we need to think about not only the bans on abortion care, but we need to think of that, um, that our federal lawmakers let, it, let the national uh, advanced child tax credit expire after only six months. We still have lack of access to universal medical care in this country. Um, we don't have any guarantee of paid parental leave, newsflash. And, um, you know, we don't, it's difficult to enforce 
workplace protections for pregnant people. It's very difficult to ask individual people to go and get a lawyer, you know, if those rights are not being recognized. So in terms of policy, those, those would be some of my next steps to reduce uh, maternal mortality. Great. No, I thank you for um, saying those specific, um, the specific, very yeah, I specific. More. I have like, yeah, a no. lot of ideas. <laughs> Please, yeah, you come, can throw them in the chat if you me. want. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's great. I think that, um, again, you also contextualize the experiences. You know, we talk about people like their data points, but they're not. <laughs> you know, all of the different uh, causes of death among pregnancies pregnant people, it's not just um, the ones that we think about or hear about in the media. There is a very complex, um, varied experience, but there's still a death resulting in it. So there are a lot of policies um, that should be included and that need to be addressed, including all of the ones that you mentioned. Another arm of your research talks about Medicaid. Could you talk a little bit about um, that side of the work too? Medicaid is the largest single health care program in the United States. Um, Medicaid pays for 42% of all pregnancy care um, and pays for on average 68% of pregnancy care among Black populations. So I like to say that the Medicaid program provides the opportunity and it provides the venue for equity-focused interventions and to address maternal morbidity and mortality. Now, past research on on Medicaid expansion, both in pregnancy and more recently under the ACA, has shown that, you know, just giving people insurance doesn't automatically reduce disparities. It doesn't automatically improve health equity. And that's probably not surprising because it's a universal program. It's It's not a program that's targeted toward equity. Just giving someone insurance is, is the floor, um, not the ceiling. Um, the other reason that we found and, and our political scientist colleagues would tell us that the, a lot of the Medicaid policy making decisions are racially, um, are politically racialized in a way that is um, harmful for our equity goals. Uh, However, I think there's a ton of opportunities in Medicaid to move forward on equity, and I'll just just name a few. I think um, I just want to say that here in Pennsylvania, our Pennsylvania Medicaid program is implementing policies that are specifically designed to improve outcomes among Black birthing people, which is a really important set of policies to be looking at. Um, I think The other panelists have talked about centering community voices and moving beyond just the numbers. And that's incredibly important. And I think our federal government has vastly under under invested in this in the Medicaid program. So in Medicare, we have a lot of uh, surveys, primary data collection, the National Health and Aging Trends Study. And we don't have any comparable investment to understand people's experiences or biomarker data or other kinds of data from the Medicaid population. I think there's an incredible opportunity there to think about how to create a national uh, pregnancy and obstetric surveillance system in this country. And I'm sure you could talk to any one of us on this panel and we would be pleased to help you um, implement that. Okay, I'd like to say one more thing. And um, so about Medicaid, and those of us who work in large academic medical centers may know that there are separate clinics. It's actually Medicaid clinic um, for OB-GYN is separated from the private insurance clinic and it's very racialized as well. And so that's uh, something I think that we need to work on within our own institutions to change that. Yeah, okay, thank you. I go back to Nishan and Shaye to talk specifically about the um, birthing work that uh, you all or your organizations do. Um, I know Michelle, you do doula as well as breastfeeding programs and all, if you could talk about that and Shaye talk about specifically what the Changing Women Initiative does because we've been talking uh, sort of up here and I wanna make sure that we know exactly, uh, you know, what the organizations do for our own um, information, as well as for others who might want to be involved in that type of work as well. So please, uh, whoever wants to go first, but I just wanna make sure that we um, talk about those specifically. 
Yeah, beforehand, um, if we could stay up high a little more um, okay. to what Dr. Jarlinski was saying about the policies, about the next steps, she talked about um, doula care. And in the state of Louisiana, that is one of the policies that we've been pushing um, forward, uh, pushing for. Last year in the 2021 legislative session, we were able to establish a doula registry board with our goal to eventually get doulas reimbursed in this state um, because of the connection that doulas, there's data to show that doula care also reduces or improves birth outcomes. And they also, serving at, uh, as a doula, I know that doulas can be more of like a, a navigator, can be the person that helps to build that relationship with that provider so that you can have more as they uh, say sometimes compliant patients. The other thing that, um, from a policy perspective here in Louisiana, uh, the Louisiana lawmakers just passed the Louisiana Perinatal Mood and Anxiety Disorder Act, which also, which is very helpful in, as we looking at those focus groups, one of the through lines between all of the focus groups, whether we were talking about breastfeeding, whether we're talking about um, childbirth and complications or in the, uh, babies in the NICU was mental health support every woman wanted mental health support. And so with this uh, new act, providers, OB and pediatricians and pediat uh, primary care providers will screen individuals for depression and anxiety so that we can get them to the resources or services that they actually need. But also um, for our general population, there will be changes in our birthing facilities because our birthing facilities now will provide information to providers, well, not to providers, to patients and their families about the signs and symptoms of perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. So learning from our colleagues in other states that just did universal mandated screening, we learned that that's not enough. Not, um, just mandating that screening happens. We need to have an education piece of it. So this act provides for that. And it also provides for the screening, but the last component of it is treatment. We wanted to make sure managed care organizations are responsible for building a resource uh, directory of perinatal mental health providers in our state so that our OBs, when someone screens at a certain level, they have a directory of where to refer, refer individuals um, to. Because our OBs in our in-depth interviews are saying, once I screen, what happens next? What do I do with these patients? Because I want to make sure that they're getting the services that we need. And we're learning that we do have perinatal mental health providers in our state, but we're not doing a great job of connecting them. Now, as far as my uh, personal work, at, so I've been working in breastfeeding for a really long time. I started my public health career. So I don't, most of my doula care work and breastfeeding work are volunteer work. Um, but I do know that, um, so we have other organizations that that's their full-time work in Louisiana, like Birthmark Doula Collective and Labor and Love. Um, NOLA Baby Cafe provides breastfeeding support for our community members in the Louisiana area. Uh, we find that uh, when we talk to individuals about breastfeeding, mental health always come up in the conversation as well. So it's very important that we know that there are services in our community, whether it's doula care and breastfeeding support. Uh, providers can connect to any one of our agencies in this state. Okay, thank you so much. I, I just wanted to make sure we talked about that um, work specifically. So we're hearing what's going on in New Orleans and Louisiana. Um, Shia, can you tell us what's going on um, sort of in your neck of the woods? I think... Um... Change of Women Initiative through Nicole Gonzalez, our founder, we kind of went backwards. You know, we just, instead of waiting for policy to be built and to be created, we went and we're like, hey, we're going to go and, and restore and renew and reclaim our indigenous sovereignty of womb wellness. Um, we feel it is important that we needed to bring back the ceremony with the traditional medicines of our people when you're bringing new life to earth. Um, and so in, in, in terms of birth in Indian country, um, that is where our, our cultural identity is strengthened and reclaimed through that birth process, through motherhood. And it's not just that birth is a symptom 
Um, we rather see it as a preparation for new life in the right way. And if we can create a space where any woman feels comfortable or any person who can give birth feels comfortable and safe, we've or already eliminated the most difficult feeling to overcome, and that is fear. Fear has such a huge impact on, on the way your body takes care of itself. Um, so we see birth as an approach as in a holistic way. And already our Native American people live in fear of white coat medicine from medical personnel who moonlight at our clinics, who aren't there, who don't have longevity at our clinics um, or hearing or experiencing forced sterilizations in the past, or even being scolded by medical personnel for your health issues. Um, CWI is working to realign ourselves with the past ways of midwifery care in our communities. Um, and we want our families to be involved. When my own mother was birthed, she was birthed by a traditional Pueblo midwife and her older sister, Anne, was an attendant, which is now known as a doula. Um, her father, her older brothers, and the men of uh, our community were outside the home singing, saying prayers, making sure the home was protected. The women of our family were more than likely cooking, um, Probably the, the rooms were filled with laughter and, you know, just making sure my grandmother was comfortable and preparing the home for the baby. And birth was an entire family waiting and preparing for its newest member. And that's what CWI is wanting to return to. It's not just mom bringing baby. You have a family. Your family is may be your the, 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 the mother's partner. Um the, the, the grandma, the grandfather. I mean, when I had my own birth, I had 12 people in the room with me and more waiting out in the waiting room, just waiting for my little, for my child to be born. And well, that's the kind of what we want. That's the kind of birth we're trying to return back to our communities. And in terms of prenatal care, yes, we do have the instruments and tools of modern med medicine, but we're also making sure that our families are well fed by locally organic grown produce and traditional foods. Um, we offer an um, immersion Diné language program for our Diné families so that they can talk to their babies while in womb and that it, it continues after the baby arrives. Um, we provide home birth services if a mama wants a home birth because a lot of families, and, and if the families don't have the capacity for a home birth, um, our new clinic has a birth and suite, which we just had a baby born. One baby was born this year. We can provide prenatal care via Zoom, or we do make the geographical distance and go to a mother's home. And it's just bringing the care to the people, not having them come to us. We are returning back to them. And that's how it would have been done in the past. And it's just working to reconnect our Native American women with that ancestral knowledge that they already have and their bodies already know so that they can, you know, return for regular womb wellness to birth services and all those decisions um, that is required. Like I said, it's not just black and white. It's a spectrum of decisions. And like I said, we work to empower our clients to bring back our ancestors medicine. And it's, it's, that's so we're kind of doing it backwards and in the terms of doing it backwards in in you know as metal modern medicine would see it as backwards we're learning like okay this is what policy needs to be developed because we're now realizing this is what's missing in this puzzle so now we can put policy right policy to make sure that puzzle so that we can get a full picture and again restore that medical um, medical care, that, that traditional medical care back to our, our native women and, and do it in, um, like the way our ancestors did. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing that because I appreciate that. I know everybody else, or I'm assuming everybody else appreciates that. Um, when we talk about systemic racism, it's something that's been imposed upon us, but before that we exist. And even with these racist systems, we exist, right? And so I appreciate you um, saying that, as my uh, grandmother would say, you got to go back to the old time way. 
Um, she would say it in a much more North Carolinian accent, but thank you. Um, I'm going to go to a question um, in the chat. Are there hospital interventions that the panel can speak to related to positive steps mentioned, such as doula care, implicit bias, et cetera, um, that research is either being done or has the potential to be investigated? So any um comments, ideas, knowledge about possible interventions that are being done or could be done that are related to um, some of the things we've talked about, like doula care, acknowledging and knowing the effects of implicit bias. Anybody have um, things about that? Yeah, go ahead, Shari. Um, Recently, our um, Nicole, uh, she had a birth that required um, transfer of care to a hospital. But what was really great was that the hospital, um, when she, when Nicole walked in there, they said, okay, you're here to catch the baby. And, and Nicole was actually taken aback because that was the first time the hospital actually acknowledged her as a midwife to be there to continue the care with our client and to be able to catch the baby. But the hospital was more of a supportive team rather than um, taking over and being the intervention. Um, we're also working with doulas and, and, and training doulas of our own community by providing um, indigenous doula training. So we have had trainings in on Navajo, Pasquayaki tribe, White Mountain, White, White Mountain River, Apache tribe, um, several on Navajo, and we're working to, to create more Pueblo doulas um, here in New Mexico. Um, because if we have these community, these women in the community being there with their client at all gamuts of, of birth, before, during, and after, um, we've noticed that, you know, breastfeeding is a little, um, is, can be easier. Uh, they have that support. There's that mental health awareness. And it, like I said, it's just learning. CWI is learning all the different puzzle pieces that are missing. And we're trying to figure out how we can fill those puzzle pieces. But, but knowing that one of our local hospitals knows that when Nicole walks in with her client, that she's there to catch the baby and the hospital is the support it's just a big step and, and a big positive step and knowing that CWI is making a mark here in New Mexico, central New Mexico. Thank you for sharing that um, and answering that question. I think in the next uh, two minutes, if you all could just share um, either broadly or specifically, however you wanna answer the question, what um, do you think the next steps are um, toward health equity for this specific um, issue of pregnancy-related mortality. Um, anyone can start, share how you like, go ahead. If I can respond to the question first. Oh yeah, sorry, go ahead. As far as doula care um, in Louisiana, there are, uh, to my knowledge, no, not uh, any hospital-based doula care programs, but there are um, community-based doula organizations. And Healthy Starts in New Orleans, and I believe in Jefferson as well, are utilizing doula care for their clients. So if individuals um, uh, are eligible for Healthy Start, then they can re receive free doula care through that. As far as implicit bias on a national level, well, both... Um, that I want to offer on are on the national uh, level. The National Birth Equity Collaborative provides a birth equity training for hospitals that deals with implicit bias. And then AIMCCC, AIMCCI, uh, which is based out of the National Healthy Start Association, they have this new um, online training through APHA called the Racial Equity Learning Series, RAILS, uh, that individuals, whether they're providers, uh, mental health doulas can do this training as well, uh, just to touch on the <clears throat> implicit bias. As far as next steps, I think it, uh, I, what I appreciate in here in New Orleans that MCH professionals are working together. 
uh, whether it's a researcher, whether it's a doula, a lactation consult, counselor, um, some OBs are a part of it and midwives as well. So I think the next step, because we know we, we've been doing the research. Um, if we listen to the research that's out there, we know what needs to be done. We just need to collaborate together and provide resources for those things that we know are working. We know doula care is working. We know that diversifying the birthing community, whether that's adding doulas, uh, removing the collaborative practice agreement so nurse practitioners and midwives can practice freely in Louisiana. So we know what needs to be done. So we need the Senator Cassidy's to sit down with the black midwives, with the researchers like Maeve and other um, advocates that are working so that we can collectively work on a strategic plan um, and implement it in the years to come. Thank you. Um, any other responses to what the next steps are in health equity in this area? I'll just I say, to, oh, real quick. Go ahead, Maeve. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, I have nothing to say. I just wanted to say I passed my mic to Michonne, who just said everything I would have said. So, <laughs> on to you. <laughs> Thanks. I just want to say thank you for letting um, the Indigenous people provide their stories. Often we are not included in these conversations. It's, it's you know, we're included in the BIPOC community, but because we are a minority in a minority, our stories are never told or rarely told. And it's, and it's always um, something that we struggle with. Um, and sure, there are a lot of things that we cannot divulge in terms of like ceremony in regards to some of the traditions, but there's some things that we need to tell you of what's happening. The things like racism, when terms of economics, geography, those things we need to tell others about. Um, and, and, and just being able to be here and to provide the stories on, on our clients and our little part of the United States that we serve um, is, is, is truly an honor to be able to be finally included in, in, in equity. I mean, equity, there's, there's that word. You're supposed to provide equal, equal equity you know, to everybody, but often there's not a balance and the Native American story is often not heard. So listening to us, we provide you the data. We, we were this part of the statistics, but you're not hearing our stories. So thank you again. And I think that is our next, is the next step in, in terms of the Native American community. Thank you. So I've, I've heard a lot of next steps here. And what I love about what I've heard and what I wanna to emphasize to everyone um, is that we just need to start doing stuff. We need, and we need um, collective action to do it. Um, we can, maybe we, Maybe we can't always rely on the Supreme Court. We can't always rely on our legislature. We can't always rely on the upper you know, administration of whatever institution we're in. So we have to come together and do what contributions we can do for equity. And so I love hearing about that um, in your community. Um, for those of us who are researchers, we can make research contributions. For those of us who are educators, we can teach. For those of us who provide care, we can keep doing that. And I really uh, think now is the time, you know, for us to come together and have a collective action uh, to work uh, toward better health equity in, in the space of pregnancy outcomes and, and family health, as we've heard here today as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's truly our honor, Shaye, um, to have you and all our other panelists and even um, the attendees um, to come to this webinar. Um, Pregnancy-related mortality is more than just statistics. It's people, it's families, it's communities. And so we just thank you all, our panelists, for um, sharing your work, your thoughts, your um, perspectives. And I know that this conversation Obviously, we're recording it, so it will be shared, but it is the start of um, the work that we're doing in this collaborative, and it's really reflective of what we want to do, bringing people together to actually move forward instead of just talking about it because we're tired 
words, you know, don't need a lot unless we have action and change and care about people and lives and equity. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to the other associate director of the collaborative, um, Dr. Andrew Anderson. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. I know we're uh, at time, so I just wanted to jump in and also express my gratitude to everyone on the panel and everybody joining us today. Uh, just to let you all know before you hop off, our next event is on Tuesday, uh, is June 21st at 1 p.m. Central Time, where we'll be talking about LGBTQ plus equity and policy and research and practice. We'll also be continuing uh, this conversation in future events. And if you'd like to stay connected and register for events and get involved in future conversations, you can sign up for P4HE by visiting our website, which has more information on this research learning collaborative, how to become a member, and also how to follow us on social media. So thank you all, and we hope to see you again soon.